So our next speaker is Dr. Dan Thompson. And I, I just realized we have two veterinarians on the, the, the program in a row, but uh, Dr. Thompson is uh, going to share with us the topic, we can sell more beef. And he'll explain what that's all about in a little bit. But uh, Dan is a third generation bovine veterinarian from Clearfield, Iowa. He has a BS in animal science from Iowa State, a master's in ruminant nutrition from uh, uh, South Dakota State and a PhD in ruminant nutrition from Texas Tech. After he received his PhD, then he went back to Iowa State for his DVM. So uh, um, he's a third generation veterinarian, as, as I mentioned. Uh, he serves as chair of the animal science department at Iowa State University. Prior to that, he was the jo Jones professor of production medicine and epidemiology at K-State. He created, founded, and directed the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State. He served as a global co-leader for McDonald's Beef Health and Wel Welfare Committee, sits on the Yum Corporation Animal Welfare Council, and chairs the Animal Welfare uh, Committee for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Um, he's uh, a rec recognized leader in uh, beef cattle production, health, and management. You may have seen him on his TV show, Doc Talk, and uh, I'm proud to say that he's my boss now. So, Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Dan. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and a lot of familiar faces, a lot of friends. And, uh, you know, to have two veterinarians, uh, I, I'm a nutritionist and a veterinarian, so people just say I argue with myself all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't have the, the uh, economics background, and I'll try not to talk too much about uh, economics in my talk today, but uh, my, some of my friends from Kansas State that are ag economists, it never stopped them from talking about veterinary medicine or cattle health. So, uh, excuse me if I do. But, you know, when I think about the beef industry, I'm so proud to be a part of it. And, and when you think about what we do and, and how we are received, no other industry serves the socioeconomic span of what we have in the United States. When we have, when someone gets a raise, they say, gather up the kids, we're going to town and we're going to have a steak. Beef is what is used to celebrate the best times in life. It is in the white tablecloth restaurants. It is at the top of the top for celebrations and for, for good events. But the thing I think we forget is that it is also used to feed the people who can't take care of themselves. When you look at the numbers for SNAP coupons in the United States, food stamps, the number three purchase with food stamps in the United States, dollar-wise, is ground beef. Hamburger is a staple in American food. So we feed from everywhere from, from the, the food stamps and the grocery stores to the white tablecloth restaurants. And so understanding that that carcass or understanding that that animal that we produce every day, people are making a choice to select um, what they put in their refrigerator. This is a painting by Kenneth Wyatt, who just recently passed away. He's an artist in Tulia, Texas, and I love his artwork. But uh, if you were a painter, and you walked into the hotel lobby and behind the desk was this picture and it was your picture. Would you be proud? Would you be excited? Someone chose the painting that you painted because they love your artwork and you have similar tastes and they put it behind there because your hard work was what they wanted in their, in their establishment. Likewise, if you were an author of a book and you walked into somebody's house and on the coffee table, the, all of a sudden you look down and there's your book that you wrote. Wouldn't there be a sense of pride, a sense of gratitude, a sense of accomplishment? That's the way we should feel every day. All of us that are involved in the beef industry, when you go to a restaurant and the people sitting next to you order a steak, or you go into a restaurant and they order a hamburger, or if you look in somebody's fridge and there's a chuck roast in there, they chose what you made. They chose what we as an industry, from the ranch to the plant to the retailer, to put into their refrigerator. When we start to think that way, we start to make changes because we want to make the next book better. We want to do something a little bit different on the next painting. And how we sell that and how we talk to people about that and how we connect with people is how we sell more beef. So how'd you get this title, We Can Sell More Beef? The gentleman there in the between the two boys, this is at Ford Farms in, in Cairo, Nebraska. 
okay? And that's Byron Ford and his sons, uh, John and Thomas, and, and uh, or William, sorry. Um, that was a funny one with uh, William, William Thomas Ford. Okay, do the initials. Anyway, Byron said it wasn't that big a deal back when they named William. But anyway, um, uh, we went out there for a visit, right? And Bruce Feinberg, who's a senior quality assurance director at McDonald's Corporation, traveled with me to look at different beef operations. And I've worked with McDonald's for over 12 years on everything from animal welfare to antibiotics to sustainability to you name it. And, and so we went on a, a trip. And we were sitting there, and finally in the cab of the pickup, Feinberg from McDonald's says, you know, you just need to get it through your thick skull. And I go, what? He goes, you're always fighting me. You're always saying, do you know how, how hard it is to do that or how this can't work or all this? He goes, you need to quit listening and quit hearing me say, you have to do this before we'll buy your product. He goes, that's not what I'm saying. He says, what I'm saying to you is that if you'll do this, I can sell more beef. If you do these things, I can sell more beef. And I hadn't thought about the point that my thought process was always someone telling me something we had to do to get into some market and all this, when in fact, it was the retailer and it was the person out there saying, I'm connected to the consumer. And if you can do this, if we can do this, I can sell more beef. So I started thinking about this one beef concept, right? If, you know, and I hear people say on the cow calf side, and it, if I don't care if we lose Thailand in the feed yard, you know, I don't use it in the, on the ranch. What we should be saying is two things. One, in the beef industry, money is neither created nor destroyed, okay? Everything between the cow-calf producer and the consumer is a margin business. So if I lose five bucks in the feeding industry, I'm either gonna pay $5 less for my calves or I need to charge $5 more for my beef. One of those two things is, is what happens. But if we can start to understand that if we can make more efficiency, if we can streamline things and increase the consumer, hopefully all tides, tides raise all boats. And, and so understanding that what we do all the way along matters, we're gonna do it differently and that's okay as long as we don't fight with each other within the industry and, and, and be our own worst enemy. People are like, well, what's the biggest problem with the beef industry today? Or who's, what groups threaten the beef industry the most today? And I said, the radicals outside the industry and the radicals inside the industry. Those are the two groups that, that won't come together. There's no middle ground and we have to have middle ground. We have too much at stake and way too many people involved in this to have any other type of viewpoint. We're facing many issues today on the farm and ranch together. This isn't just about agriculture. This is about people that are retailers of beef are facing it. They're taking the brunt, okay? The greatest distance between two people is the last three feet. And like it or not, the last three feet between our beef industry and the consumer is the retailer. We should be taking care of them and working with them on a day-to-day -day basis to help them sell more beef. Because we're the, we're the manufacturing, we're the ones that are, that are building the cars and, and putting them in and working with that dealer or working with that retailer is, is vital. Today's society is scared of things that they don't, first of all, they get scared about everything on TV, right? <laughs> the sky is falling constantly, uh, everything's a crisis. And so they really don't know what to believe. And so there's this fear of being uninformed and people are two, three, four generations removed from the, the home or from the, from the farm. And when we start to think about what people have as far as their relationship to, of animals today, it's not agriculture, right? It's what? Pets. They say, I heard Lowell Catlett say that 84% of people who own pets consider that pet to be their child. 85% of the people that own pets say they would risk their life to save their, 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 their pet's life, okay? Now, the, neither one of those numbers bother me. It's the 1% that says that they would they consider the pet to be their child, but wouldn't risk their life to save it are the people that have issues, okay? And so when we start to think about this, 
we have to educate them that our intent from the time we put the bull in the pasture with the cows, our intent from that point is to produce food, not a 1500 pound lap dog. And so as we convince them and as we talk to them, it's gonna bring them closer and closer to us. If I walk into a third grade classroom and I say, where'd that milk come from? What, what are the students gonna say? The store, right? They don't say a cow, a farm. They are disconnected from where their food comes from. And, and as we bring them back and as we start to teach them, I think every school should have a fifth or sixth grade class on food production in, their, in society. So they understand, and then they go home, they're still talking to their parents in fifth and sixth grade, and they can reteach and go through this with their parents at the dinner table. I think it's vitally important to our country's uh, security. And lastly, we live in a first world country. And people are like, well, what does that mean? I've worked with the OIE, and of the 135 member countries of the OIE, 75% of them are developing or third world countries. Money equals food. Poverty equals starvation. We are so blessed to live in a first world country and have the problems that we have, that we face, that we argue about. They say a person whose belly is half full has many problems and a person who's starving has got but one. And our bellies are half full, so we have a consumer that's completely different, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Food is abundant in the United States. It's extremely cheap. When you look at the price of food spent at the home, in China versus the United States, you know, we're at 6% of our personal income is spent on food at the home. Uh, we waste a lot of food. This was a study done at K-State where in the dining services where they measured how much food the kids scraped and they scraped a quarter pound of breakfast, a third of a pound of lunch and a half pound of dinner. They threw away a pound of prepared food a day, 14,000 students, the, the valued at, at five bucks a, a pound they threw away $70,000 worth of food a day in the dining services. It changed just by putting a little sign up there about how much food we waste. It's, 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 it's an awareness, it's this, this abundance. And then the obesity rates in the United States. Today, the obesity rate in the United States is 42%. Uh, it's estimated that by 2030, we'll be at 50% at obesity in our country with 25% of people with severe obesity. And, and so, why, why am I talking about this all in the same thing is here we are in a country where we have a lot of money, we have an overabundance of food, but yet we still have a problem with food insecurity. And we'll touch on some of those as we move forward. Now, I have people always tell me, well, the reason why we're eating so much less at, or spend so much money less at home is because we spend, we're going out to eat more. That's not true. From 1929, in the United States, we spend 4% of our personal income on food at, at a restaurant. Okay, it's always been 4%. And so restaurants understand that they have a capped income, right, or a capped potential. So if a new niche pops up, or a new, a new fad pops up, or a new restaurant change pops up, and they start taking money out of that 4%, it's coming from somebody else's pocket. So it's at that point, you either have to destroy the niche or you have to take it over. And the reason why restaurants have jumped out with some of the claims that you've seen, in my opinion, is that restaurants do not feed the poor. You cannot use SNAP coupons or food stamps at a restaurant. Restaurants feed people who can afford to have someone else plan the meal, cook the meal, and do the dishes. They're selling a service plus the food. Grocery stores feed the masses. We found that out in COVID, right? Where was the hamburger? When was the hamburger gone? When people couldn't go out to eat. And so when we start to think about this and, and how it, the, the grocery stores feed everybody, the restaurants feed the people that, and you think, well, you don't have to be that rich to go to McDonald's. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along as well. So some of the key points that we're gonna talk about today, beef is the best product, period. We have to continue to con put the best product on the table. Uh, I thought it tied in really well with Dr. Pillen's uh, uh, visit. We need to continuously improve. Just because you're the best football team in the country doesn't mean you don't need, want to get a little bit better tomorrow. Um, food is inexpensive, so it causes us some issues. Activists today are masquerading as the consumer, and they are the people who are taking the brunt of the activism are the retailers of our products. They need us to work with them. They just need information. They need data. They need connection 
because they're the ones that are facing the brunt and we have to be connected to them for all of our sakes. Um, beef is safe, wholesome, and nutritious. We support raising beef in different ways. If we don't support raising beef in different ways, we will just miss out on people who want a certain product as, as evidenced in the first presentation this morning. Those people are seeking it out. We need to provide it for them. Otherwise, they're gonna eat a different protein source, right? So we need to be acceptable of all ways of doing business. And the segments have to work together. And that means a lot of different things. And moving to Iowa, I've learned a lot more about the differences in, in some of the, the transparencies and, and things like that and marketing. I won't get into that today, um, but, but we have to have fair market access. We have to have sharing of profits up and down the chain. We cannot be sustainable without profitability, but we have to also agree that we're gonna work together on a strategic plan to move it forward together and not just spit the bit and say, well, I'm not gonna do that because they aren't gonna pay me for it, okay? Well, and we'll talk a little bit. But remember this, if we make some of these changes, we can sell more beef. Sustainability, I was talked about sustainability in, in DC, and I said, I'm not a sustainability person. They said, well, just come give us, you know, kind of your version of it. And as I studied it, you know, the definition of sustainability is to, eat, you know, leave it just a little bit better than you found it or to maintain what you're doing. And in a first world country, it's really important to worry about sustainability, right? Because we want to keep it. We want to keep what we have. It's hard to talk about this in a developing or third world country because they're like, hey, I, listen, Jack, I just want to eat. I want to get vaccinations, sustainability. I don't want to sustain this. And so what you have dictates that. And then on the environmental side, it always amazed me. I have four daughters, okay? And I don't know how many times we've watched that movie, Miss Congeniality, or parts of it in the last 20 some years, or however long that movie's been out. But all the beauty pageants get up there and their answer, regardless of the question, is world peace, right? Well, with sustainability, the world peace answer to sustainability is save the planet, save mankind. Well, that's just a little big of a concept for me, right? We're gonna to have to cook book it down. I can't just jump out there and start with that as the goal. We have to have simplified goals and we have to understand that. You know, and you have to ask the question when somebody says, what do you want to sustain? Well, is it mankind? Is it your country? Is it your family? Is it your business? Define to me what you wanna sustain and then I can help you. The other thing is in the restaurant world and in the different commodity group worlds, Sustainability is not about saving the world. It's about predicting who's going to be in business. We're trying to figure out with sustain, who's going to be sustainable based on their practices. So when you start to hear people say, well, they're looking at environment, they're looking at economics, they're looking at community engagement. It's like who in the industry are making the right practices so that we can predict based on those practices, who's going to be in business in 10, 20, and 30 years ago or 30 years to come. This is not about saving the planet. This is about figuring out who's still going to be in business. So if you're making these practices on the habitat on your, your ranch, or if you're doing this with the, the genetics and matching your cows to the environment and the, the bulls to your market and different things to that nature, who survived the drought? Who kept their cows? What was their practice? We need to learn more from them. Those are the people that are going to be in business, and that's who I want to start to target and focus in on, because as we have a growing global population, protein is going to be decreased, or is relative, pro, the amount of protein per capita is going to be decreased. So I'm trying to figure out who is going to be in business, who's going to be my partner in the future. And I'll tell you this, and everything I looked at on global climate change, global climate change will have more of an impact on agriculture than agriculture will ever have on global climate change. It is gonna change what we farm, where we farm it, and, and what we produce. Tastes, population centers, those types of things are gonna change. We have to move with it as an industry. But the last thing to, to think about when it comes to sustainability, at the end of the day, we can talk about all the things around the outside which are important, but we have to remain profitable. Without profitability, um, we can't, can't be sustainable. So we'll do it, 
and we'll increase the in external costs, but we have to have more income. I think that sustainability is probably the best example of all people in the supply chain coming together to solve a problem or work together on an issue. With this, we have not, we have, if we use the US Roundtable for sustainable, sustainable Beef as the model and just change the words for welfare, change the words for, for, for um, antibiotic usage or whatever, I think you would see great outcomes because now everybody is on the same page, whether it's, whether it's from the, the packing industry, from the retail industry, from producers, uh, and even some of the NGOs, the non-government organizations, bringing them in. But we are going to be a global leader in environmentally sound, socially responsible, economically viable beef. It's got to be affordable. Animal health and welfare, you know, when we go through this, and, and I told Dr. Loy this changed my, my scope, I usually talk about things we got to improve, things we got to get better at. And, and this one is, let's tell the story of what we have done well. All right, we're going to have activists every day coming in saying that animal rights activists use animal abuse cases to drive animal welfare legislation. Three different words there, right? Animal rights is that you believe animals have the same rights as humans. Animal abuse is animal cruelty. Animal welfare is what we do. We do the chores. We vaccinate. We break ice for the cows. Um, we do all the provide shelter, nutrition, all those things. I'm not going to apologize for doing a great job of that. We need to talk about all that we do and, and move it forward. And, and animal welfare is important to our marketing. We did a, a consumer survey at McDonald's. And if we asked people animal wealth, what animal welfare was, if we asked six people, we got seven different answers. But the two things that came out of that uh, study, the two things, is that a safe food product comes from a healthy animal. And a healthy animal is one that had good animal welfare. So then health, as Dr. Pillen said, became the focus, healthy animals and, and understanding that that changes. And so now it's not the animal welfare committee, it's the animal health and welfare uh, committee. Stephen Covey wrote a book, Stephen Covey Jr. wrote a book called The Loss of, of or The Speed of Trust. And in that book, it says, as trust erodes, the cost of business goes up and the speed of business slows down. These activist groups are trying to erode the trust between our retailers and our producers. So therefore we have audits, right? And so we're going to have audits in the future, whether it's in the feed yards, packing plants have six or seven or 10 different audits today, depending on what retailer. Um, and, and so I'm not a big fan of audits, uh, but it's gonna be some of the, the reality and the assessments, but we're already doing it, right? We're doing it today. I'll give an example of how they don't work, and that's our, in our school systems. You don't, what is our audit system today in the schools? We don't have an audit where you go in and do a checklist of how the students are run through the lunch line and no hot shot usage or things of that nature, but we have what we call standardized testing, right? And whether you know it or not, standardized testing is an audit. We have put a line up here and say, we're going to be this smart. And guess what? Once you put a line up there, what do the teachers do? They teach to the test. We're just gonna be this smart. The last 10 years, our scores on, we spend a billion dollars a year in the Department of Education on standardized testing to be this smart. In the last 10 years, our scores have not gone up at all. They don't change because we said how smart we're gonna be, right? When we say that in any audit, that's how good we're gonna be. We have to be better. We have to continuously be better. But when you start to think about the, 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 the level, the schools and the, that increase English or improve in English, they don't increase the number of English classes. They start teaching accountability, uh, transparency, integrity, and the core pillars of character. And the students understand that if I'm going to be accountable, I need to do my English. Those are the things, it's no different than our industry. Those are the things we have to continuously sell is our accountability, our integrity, and nobody relates better to a consumer than us. We've done so much in the history for animal welfare, we forgot about it, right? Things that you wouldn't even think about as animal welfare, think about Cavanese bulls. Okay, I, my dad 
I can remember as in their clinic, the reason why I didn't go to vet school right off the bat, I can remember being in Southwest Iowa and we would do three C-sections a night. It was the Semitol Key Angus cross. I mean, we had, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. Charlay, it was, and, and, and we changed that. And we didn't even capitalize on the story. You think everybody could relate to Cavinese, right? If you tell the story about how we changed and how we invested all these dollars to make it easier on mama and to make it easier on us and to make it easier on the baby. That is a huge animal welfare story. Um, you know, earlier castration and dehorning, I've told everybody, the longer the testicles are on the calf, the more attached the calf is to the testicles, all right? There's no reason to leave the testicles on those calves till they're weaned. We have to make these changes. The horns, dairies have it figured out. 50% of the dairy cows that go out there are born with horns but you never see one walk in the parlor because they just disbud them when they're a day old. You could carry a butane disbutter in the glove box and be done with horns in your herd that morning. Let them get colostrum first, okay? Um, and then I'll just end with this one because there's so many on here, but the, the coal cows and the chronics, you would have never thought this. The, the new words and, you know, you've heard dairy beef in our industry. Have you heard about, you know? Yeah, everybody in here has, right? Well, now, don't think that retailers aren't smart because now it's not cold dairy cows. That's dairy beef, <laughs> right? We feed dairy beef. And so they're going to, they're gonna, whether it's dairy beef of a crossbred beef animal on dairy and, or an embryo put in a dairy cow that's dairy beef, if it comes off a of dairy, whether it was a, a cold cow or it's a feeder calf, that's dairy beef. We have beef and dairy beef. And, and so understanding that as that's going to play forward is going to be important. Antibiotics. First thing you have to understand in antibiotics is where we use them. In the beef industry, 92% in the feedlots, 92% of the antibiotics used in the United States in feedlots uh, comes from Tylosin and CTC in the feed. Most of it is for the control of liver abscesses. If we didn't have Tylen and CTC in the feed, we would reduce our antibiotic use in the beef industry by 92 to 95% overnight. It's amazing what it, what it, what it does. Two and a half percent is used for metaphylaxis on arrival. Two to 4% is used to treat calves for foot rot, bovine respiratory disease, whatever. So first we were worried about residues, correct? So we have withdrawal times. Well, when you look at the percentage of carcasses that are slaughtered that have no residues and these are the ones that we pull off the line and we check the kidneys and the livers the worst is dairy beef at 99.85 percent of those carcasses had no residues it we do a tremendous job of of with veterinarians and producers on the ground of of not having residues but now we're moving from residue avoidance to resistance avoidance we're getting better and so when you think about all the things that are in place, and when I explain to consumers or chefs that you have to have a valid veterinary client patient relationship at the feedlot before you can get the antibiotic, the F and DA, that was my Dan Upson. He always told me, Dan Upson always said, now young doctor, he said, uh, remember that there's the word and between food and drugs. So whenever you introduce it, you need to say the F and DA. So the F and DA approves all of the drugs and approves the, the, um, safety and the withdrawal times. And then the, the jurisprudence of our state veterinary licensing board makes sure that we ad adhere to all that. Once it goes to the packing plant, there's an antemortem inspection, there's a postmortem inspection. There's microbiology done on every tote of beef before it leaves to make sure that there is no bacterial foodborne pathogen that might carry the antibiotic resistance. Then when it goes to the processor, there's more microbiology testing before it goes out. And then when it gets to the restaurant, you think, well, it's done. No, that's when the State Department of Agriculture kicks in with inspections, making sure we're storing it right, cooking it right. We have an unbelievable system that all Americans invested in to not have antibiotic resistance in our, in our beef. The consumer wants continuous improvement. They know that we're not gonna get it all fixed tomorrow, but let's prioritize. Let's continue to move forward. We have an unbelievable story on antibiotics. We started in the 80s with beef quality assurance, right? We weren't going to have any more residues in the, in the carcasses. 
Then in the 90s, we got Amduka, the, the an extra label drug use, that we were going to use drugs the way they were labeled unless written specifically on a prescription by a veterinarian. We then had the veterinary feed directive, and, 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 the, and there will be more to come. But that's okay. Instead of sitting there fighting about antibiotics, we should be telling the story of all that we've, we've done. I want to get to some of these on the, the um, alternative protein. And I had someone come up to me, and they, they held a soy something in my face, and they said, this is better for the environment. And, and it's more humane for the cattle. And I said, do you really believe cattle are that bad for the environment? And they said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, I think you'd want us to eat them all. I said, what are you going to do if we quit eating them? You going to run around and shoot them? I mean, the, com the common sense concept of this is mind boggling to me. And, and as, as we think about this and we think about moving forward, you know, and then the animal welfare, I'm not going to apologize for the job we do providing shelter, taking care of animals versus just letting them have as they, they may. But we did a study, and this is Sam Davis's uh, research at K-State, and we looked at three different retail uh, uh, plant-based patties, and, we, and this was funded by the Kansas Beef Council, thank you, and Sam Davis, Travis O'Quinn, they shepherded the project that we were all a part of, and we looked at three different products of alternative beef patties. And at the end of the day, we compared it to 90-10, 80-20, and 70-30 beef patties. And the consumers, we had 200 consumers that were not trained. They came in, and you can see this. They didn't think it tasted very good, right? On the right are the three uh, alternatives. On the left are the three different types of beef patties. They didn't think so. Then we went to a trained sensory panel. And when you look at it for overall uh, beef flavor, the three alternatives didn't even hardly make it on the screen. And when you look at texture of when you take a bite, they weren't very good. And when for you have non-beef odor, which is a bean odor, okay, um, you can see that they didn't smell like beef. And so at the end of the day, we got to do the research. We got to tell our story. Um, raising cattle is good for the environment. We have the best product. Um, it's good for human health and child development. And at the end of the day, the alternatives don't stack up, okay? Technology. Um, we have heard a lot about differences in technology that are used. And we have organic, natural, conventional beef. I, you know, if you raise it or you eat it, I don't care. If you're in the beef industry, I'm for you. If you consume beef, I'm for you. Because if we don't produce it differently, it's, it's going to leave us with markets that are, that are not managed or not used. But my problem, my rub, is when you tell me that something that is raised conventionally is not as safe, not as wholesome, or not as nutritious, right? We can't market against ourselves within the beef industry. I mean, Dr. Loy's work right here is that if you consume an eight-ounce steak from a steer that was implanted, you'll have three nanograms of estrogenic activity. If you eat an eight-ounce steak from a non-implanted steer, you'll have two nanograms of estrogenic activity. One nanogram is a, per kilogram is equivalent to a blade of grass on a football field. Now. If you ate eight ounces of tofu, which I put this right after some of the alternative proteins because they're made with legumes and soybeans and different things to that, you will consume 51 million nanograms of estrogen from an eight ounce tofu sandwich, okay? So understanding it. Now I have four daughters. There's a lot of things I don't understand in life, but one thing I've got a pretty good handle on anymore is estrogen. And a pregnant woman produces 19 million nanograms of estrogenic activity. Uh, a non-pregnant female, 500,000. We can't throw away a technology that improves the sustainability and the environmental uh, aspects of our business and the amount of feed needed to grow beef over a blade of grass on a football field. We have to use the science, okay? And I'll wrap up with this segment. We can't turn back. In this country, there were 60 babies born during this presentation. There were 244 babies born in China and 351 babies born in India. Norman Borlaug said, we will have to raise the same amount of food over the next 40 years for the growing global population as we have the last 10,000. We are gonna have to have better genetics. We're gonna have to have better systems. We can't rest on our laurels. We have to continue to get better, but we have to do it together. 
We have to do it together. There are two groups that don't care about science and food, okay? The rich and the poor. The rich will just err to the side of safety because they can't, right? Why clog my brain up with this when I'll just buy this and I don't have to worry about it? I'll go on to the next topic. The poor just want to eat. And so understanding who the market is of the organic and natural products, I think is different than understanding a single mom with two kids that just wants to feed her children so that they grow and, and develop mentally. We forget how little money people make in this country. The median household income, this is two incomes, okay? Four people in the house, two incomes. The median household income is $50,000 a year. That, that is 25,000 per capita, okay? And 25% and of Americans live in a household of four that make $25,000 or less. That is the, the two things that we use to determine poverty in the United States, the cost of food and the number of people in the house. But it's the cost of food that determines poverty. If we make changes that increase the cost of food, but don't bring up the incomes of people in this country, we will increase the amount of poverty that we see. And it's not, it's evenly distributed across the United States. This is food insecurity in the United States. 14.5% of the people in the United States cannot get food on their dinner table, okay? 35% of single women raising kids can't get the proper nutrition on the dinner table. That's the largest demographic of food insecurity, okay? It doesn't matter if you're from the city. It doesn't matter if you're from a rural community. There's just as much food insecurity in Scranton, Iowa, as there is in Des Moines, Iowa. It's just there's a lot more people in Des Moines. And, and so understanding whether it's a rural community or an urban community, there's more uh, food insecurity in Hispanic and African-American families. We need to quit thinking of this as an agricultural issue. We started partnering with the NAACP. We started partnering with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We started partnering with the Teamsters because this is an if you eat issue. This is an American issue. This is a global issue. We just decide we're just gonna take it all on ourselves. If we do this, we can sell more beef. We need to start looking, but this is what at the end, you know, when they say the best pig wins, the best product wins. And the one thing we can't forget is what brought us here. Safety, freshness, taste, health, nutrition. And, and um, we have what man cannot live without. We have to remember our core pillars of what brought us here. We have the best tasting product, the safest product. We need to look for new beef products. This is a human health issue, not an agricultural issue. And we can sell more beef, but we're gonna have to do it learning together, communicating and implementing change. I put this up here because um, I've gotten to work with many different industries since I've come to Iowa State. And they wanna always tell me how the poultry numbers keep going up and, uh, you know, and they keep eating more poultry. Well, up here is the, the amount of, of increase in, in poultry, and they talk about a slight decrease over the last 30 years in, in red meat consumption. Well, if you remember how they used to always market against us for health in the beef industry? <laughs> well, if you take a look at what's happened the last 30 years in the amount of poultry consumed and the increase in, in uh, obesity and diabetes, maybe we weren't so bad after all. But as we start to think about it and we do this together, we can sell more beef. We have the healthiest product. So until we meet again, thank you for letting me be up here. Dr. Loy, thank you for all you've done. Let's be mindful on our communication strategy and let's sell beef together. Let's not disparage one person or the other within our industry. Let's, let's stick up for all people. Safe, secure beef is essential for human health. There's no doubt about it. We need to track progress, okay? Would you sell, buy a bull without looking at the EPDs? Our retailers and our consumers wanna know how we're doing it. And every time we, we get scared about tracking something or looking at our antibiotic usage or what we do, it's kind of like going in for a physical exam, right? And before you go in there, you're nervous and you're like, geez, they gotta take your blood pressure three times till you calm down and get it to where it's like actually normal because you just know they're gonna find something bad this time. And they don't. And you walk out and you're like, shoot, we're doing a pretty good job. We find that out every time we do that in the beef industry. 
We're doing a tremendous job. Don't be embarrassed or shy or bashful about anything we're doing because I've been all over this country in this beef industry and nobody does beef better than what we do in the United States, period. We should be so proud. We need to turn to non-traditional groups to form partnerships when we're working on legislature. There's no doubt about that and, and it kind of breeds common sense. We have the best product, we have the best, the healthiest product, and we have the best system. Let's get better, let's sell more beef. And the last thing is, is this, there's no other commodity group, period, that can connect with the consumer the way that we can in the beef industry. You just say, come on, jump in the pickup, let's go look at some cows. We got it. We got so much to be proud of. I'm so thankful I get to be a part of it and thankful for today. Thanks.